Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Culture Cast. I'm Chris Stashu, and I am joined by King Payman himself, <laughs> Mr. Eric Niss. You motherfucker, <laughs> say something. <laughs> You'll get it when you when you get the audio. It was actually kind of perfect. <laughs> uh, you can edit all of this stuff out, but you'll get it. Um, yeah, hi, I'm here. I'm, uh, yeah, hail me, because Wow, obviously, really? Whew, boy, you're really, pay tribute to someone else's podcast who's way more successful than we are. Whew, Eric's boy. a pussy, dude. Don't listen to him. Oh, uh, whatever. <laughs> and uh, we're joined by one of Eric's bandmates in Wavoka. He's been on the Culture Cast a couple times. I don't think you've ever been on the Culture Cast. Just you, though. No, this would be the first. Yes, Mr. Rashid. I, I'm not gonna. Hello. I don't want to butcher your last name. Najib. 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 I, I was gonna say it that way, but I didn't want to say it wrong. So <laughs> Rashid uh, Najib. Rashid Najib. It just, it just falls and, uh, out of your mouth. So we're all here <laughs> to talk Kyle. about. <laughs> uh, we're all here to talk about a movie that has been. Uh, really hyped a horror movie that's been really hyped an indie horror movie that's been really hyped what a surprise in 2018 it seems like every year we get one last year was get out however that movie stood up to the hype the year before i think was the witch and then the year before that was it follows and i think the year before that was the babadook so this this year's this year's indie horror movie that's been unnecessarily hyped is hereditary film is directed and written by Ari Aster, it stars Tony Collette, Alex Wolf, Millie Shapiro, Ann Dowd, and Gabriel Byrne for a minute or two. And the film follows Tony Collette's Annie Graham as she tries to keep her and her family's life together after the passing of her super secretive mother. Just they kept saying that shit, and it was it really started to bother me. Come on, Peter. Here's your suit. It's heartening to see so many strange new faces here today. I know my mom would be very touched and probably a little suspicious. My mother was a very secretive and private woman. It's Grandma. You know you were her favorite, right? Even when you were a little baby, she wouldn't let me feed you because she needed to feed you. She was a very difficult woman, which maybe explains me. I recognize you from your mother. What? Sometimes I swear I can feel them in the room. Oh my God! What was that? She isn't gone. She had private rituals, private friends. Who's gonna take care of me? You don't think I'm gonna take care of you? But when you die. She wasn't altogether there. At the end. any more stress on my family. So we're going to talk spoilers because I don't think there's any way we can't with this. Yeah, this movie, you can't talk about this movie without talking about spoilers. I think it is literally futile to attempt to do so. So if you haven't seen this movie, just what the fuck are you doing? Go see it. And then come back and listen. To if me. you haven't seen this movie, which realistically you haven't seen it because this movie made like no money. So unfortunately, uh, I saw that coming. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. You and I saw it with the first day it was out. So because we were super hyped on it. Yeah. What, for months. You, I went to the eight o'clock showing and you went to the 11. How many people were in your theater? Maybe 20 to 30. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, mine was actually like probably three quarters full, like two thirds, three quarters. Oh, full. yeah. Not at all for me. 
Oh, okay. My theater had three people in it, but then again, I went and saw it on a Monday afternoon. So there was like an old man next to me yeah, eating popcorn, and that was it. And he was oh, like, "Oh no, he was, was he smiling popcorn. at you the no, entire time? No, no, no. He was eating popcorn very loudly, and it was like, and he was like clearing the kernels out of his teeth. And I was you like, should have like looked over at him and be like, take your teeth out, you old piece of shit.' I was like, "What the fuck? This is a movie theater, not a fucking dining hall, bro. <laughs> Jesus Christ." Uh, but anyways, I'm curious, Rashid, since this is your first time being on the Culture Cast, what did you think of Ari Aster? the director writer of the film what did you think of his debut horror film so honestly in i thought the movie as a whole was just okay there were a lot of stuff i didn't like about the movie but i mean there was a lot of stuff i loved about the movie the writing i loved the directing, I loved. I think he did a fantastic job. But I think it's more of some of the technical aspects of the film, some of the some of the ways he like decided to move the story didn't work for me. Um, yeah, I don't know. To me, it was just an all right film. But it doesn't mean that I didn't hate it. You know what I mean? No, I'm I'm with you. Uh, let's let's give Eric a chance to 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 fawn over this movie because I want you to I want you to recreate Eric the phone call that you you had with me over the weekend. I still have the message on my phone that you left me where you sounded distraught, to say the least. Um, yeah, this movie affected me in a really big way. Um, like, honestly, I think the last time a movie affected me like this was when I was like, um, I don't know, eight or nine years old and I watched The Shining for the first time. Um, so I I mean, I, I knew nothing about this movie going into it. I had seen uh, like the very first trailer that came out like, I don't know, almost six months ago. Um, and that was it. And that was all I cared to know about this movie. And I had just heard the hype coming out of the, um, you know, uh, Sundance and then uh, South by Southwest and um, everybody's like, oh my God, it's the fucking scariest thing since The Exorcist and I'm just going, la 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 la. I don't want to fucking hear anything. Don't fucking tell me anything about this fucking movie. I don't want to fucking know. Um, and so I went into it um, with actually relatively tempered expectations. Like I didn't want to be too hyped because I knew that if I was too excited about it, it would just be a letdown like every other movie that I go into that I'm super stoked about. Um, and this movie definitely challenged and subverted every expectation that I had about it, um, which was very few uh, to begin with. And it left me just completely, I, I, I don't know how to describe it other than hollowed out. Like I left this movie completely hollowed out. Um, like everything that was lovely and wonderful in the universe was ripped away from me for several hours. Uh, this movie was very unrelenting um, in an amazing way. And I think I agree that this movie has more than a, a couple of shortcomings, but I think the tone and the feeling and the dread that this movie induces, um, at least to me, more than made up for um, some of the shortcomings that the film had. Um, so I was kind of the same way. I totally agree with Eric about the, the tone of the film. So while I'm watching it, I'm like, okay, this is okay. I hate this part. I hate this part. This is okay. Oh my God, this is fucking crazy. I love it. I love it. I love it. No, I hate it again. Well, because you texted me after the movie and you were just like, meh, it was all right. right. S- seven out of 10. And then you texted me like an hour later exactly. and you were like, right. right. Now I understand what you were talking about. So when, so when I left the film, I'm like, okay, like I feel kind of fucking weird right now. And then I'm just like on my balcony. I'm smoking a cigarette, drinking like one last beer before I go to bed. And I'm like, no, actually, I feel really fucking weird right now and i'm just thinking about like all the fucking shit that they did in the movie and then i'm like wait do i actually love this movie and then i went to bed and woke up and i'm like no i I still don't (laughs) but the the tone of the movie they fucking nailed it and the feeling you get after watching the film i think they did the most incredible job and like eric said with the shining like for me that movie is 
Prince Pet Cemetery that fucking killed me when I was a kid. And I haven't felt that way about a movie like after watching it since Hereditary. Just kind of, of the tone of a film. So, you know, we're, we're talking about these movies that really uh, affected us. And I am I'm not I'm not trying to show how big my nuts are here. I'm really not. But like this, this movie doesn't this movie like didn't uh, t- I don't know. This movie didn't rattle me as much. Maybe it's because, and I'm not going to blame you, Eric, but maybe it's because you told me how rattled you were that I was like expecting to be rattled when I walked out of it. And so when I walked out of it and it was just, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a well-crafted, highly polished indie horror movie that looks a lot better than it actually operates. And I think that that is pretty much a, I mean, I just described the witch i just described it follows (laughs) i just described the babadook and that's a problem for me i mean you're totally right it really is like those other three fucking movies yeah it really is and that's and that's a bad thing for me because i I agree i agree 100 with you on that i felt that the witch was overly polished it was a cool concept it was nice to look at it was well thought out the director put in a lot of time a lot of effort into getting it to be historically accurate and then the payoff at the end of the movie is so just it's so blah it's so just kind of boring and you kind of see it coming from a mile away it's not really surprising this movie i'll give it credit the ending of this movie is the most interesting part of the film because for two hours and five minutes two hours and t- two hours yeah this movie is absolutely reserved it's i would say it's pretty close to like the conjuring in the level of like this the the stuff that it's showing on screen it's not really sh- it, it's not, it's not showing anything like that breaks the mold it's just kind of it's doing the haunted house the ghost in a haunted house trope that we've seen in horror movies going all the way back to films made in the 20s and 30s it's just doing it in a 21st century house with a 21st century cast sure um Honestly, yeah. When I was watching the movie, there was like, I think a solid 10 or 15, maybe even 20 minutes, like in the middle of the movie, um, after one of like the major fucked up points happens, um, like within the first third of the movie that I just went, okay, why did we slow down so hard? Why this, like, why does this need to be here? Why is this there? And it made sense at the very end. And I and looking back on it and talking to other people about this movie, um, I don't think you can have the movie make sense like it does without that like m- middle 10 to 20 minutes like that feels really slow. I just uh, also don't know how you make it not feel slow. Well, and I don't have any problem, problem with the film being slow. My problem with the film being slow is that it's just, it do, it's slow for slow's sake, and it doesn't do anything new. It's just doing right. the same tricks. I mean, that's one of the things I read. It's like the film doesn't use jump scares. The film is, it's a very highbrow horror. Yeah, but sure. you know what? Just because you don't use jump scares doesn't mean you don't get lumped into now a new category of films that right. don't use jump scares that are just highbrow horror. Cough, yeah, cough, but- The Witch, which was... Uh, uh, or, or even a Thai West film. The House of the Devil is... I mean, oh, love this, the House of the Devil. But but again, it's very similar to the House of the Devil. But this is very similar sure. to the House of the Devil. Yeah. So it's again, it's you know, oh well. Uh, first off, fuck you if you don't like jump scares. There's something to be said for a well crafted jump scare. Oh, over yeah. abu- yeah, over absolutely. abusing over abusing it. Yeah, of course. But over abusing any genre trope gets old real fast. Over abusing a a ghost in a haunted house trope gets old really fast. Oh, sure. there's there's something off in the corner that's out of focus. They do that like four times in this movie and. And then the fourth time I was like, are you fucking serious? God damn it. I don't know. Stop. I felt I felt like this movie earned the scares that it got. And that's like there's maybe, uh, I don't know, one or two like quote unquote jump scares in this movie. And they're sort of I don't know, one of them is kind of an anti jump scare. It's like one of those things where it's like, um, you know, something happens, but it's not necessarily something horrific that happens. It's just something unexpected. Um, like when the bird hits the fucking window. Yeah, but that was in the trailer. But that was in the trailer. And then 
there's like a a couple of points where like some other things happen like when the when the grandmother first shows up in the room that's not a jump scare in the traditional sense like there wasn't like a loud banging like bang noise or like a loud like violin scrape or something like that but it was everybody in the theater that i was in fucking lost it when that fucking shit showed up i'll give that to you for sure like that part scared the fuck out of me the part with the naked people in the darkness scared the fuck out of me and then the most part that i got scared was the fucking mom scurrying on the wall you know you just kind of see this white like blanket you know in the background and you're like okay i dude i thought that that was somebody and then i was like no that's not somebody i was like that's just the i'm like that's just like the molding in the on the ceiling or whatever that's like not a person and then in the next shot you see her scurry across the ceiling and i went like a spider you know and it's just like i mean a i easily get scared i'll be the first to admit it yeah you're fine but yeah like eric said it's not traditional in the way of, of a jump scare but i still think like those few parts were effective but again it's it's more a matter of the abuse of it than how they did it they kept doing those out of focus shots and they did it so many times where once or twice cool but on the third or fourth time when this movie is supposed to be some sort of highbrow horror film that breaks the mold and it's the most upsetting powerful film of the last decade and it keeps reusing the same thing over and over again that's i mean that's the thing i don't i honestly think people are gonna walk away from this movie being like man those last five ten minutes were crazy everything else eh it's okay but the last ten minutes of this movie are verifiably absolutely bananas fucking batshit crazy and you know what you can't that can't sustain you can't make a whole movie like that i mean you can but it's it wouldn't be that good well (laughs) well i don't know that's the movie i was expecting you were expecting batshit from the word go well the way people are but the way that people are describing it i mean rashid is completely justified and they so you guys both know that i am the slow burn aficionado the slower the burn the better i mean you know the way that they build this movie is going to be effective for some people and not effective for other people some people are just going to be fucking bored by the time that the crazy shit happens and then other people myself in this group are going to be very invested in what's going on by the time shit hits the fucking fan and then if you're at that point when shit hits the fan this movie movie is going to be the fucking craziest movie that you've seen maybe in your entire life but the, my problem with the movie wasn't that it was slow my problem with the movie was it just didn't do anything original it didn't do anything unique or exciting outside of the last 10 minutes of the movie and even the last 10 minutes of the movie felt very similar and I, again I, i'm having a hard time placing what it is exactly but i i watched something recently I, I watched something recently that has this like this twist at the end where it's like and now the main character characters possessed by the devil or possessed by a demon and this was their plan all along and i can't place what movie that is but again it's just this didn't feel as unique and exciting as the critics in quotations are making it out to be yeah well i mean critics are just shit anyways you know <laughs> yeah who cares what critics think yeah. we Speaking are from experience eric and i are, are shit <laughs> we are critics yes and we are shit our opinions mean nothing just like every other critic's opinion means nothing because the stuff that I like is not the same stuff that anybody else likes and that's why yeah, we exactly. all talk about And also about art is subjective but Yeah, it highly subjective Like I said, I was highly affected by this movie and want to go see it again but I'm also terrified to go see it again and I'm sure that you guys don't feel the same way that see, I, I feel. I, well, probably never watch this movie again actually i know that for a fact i'm with Unless... rashid i don't i mean i didn't wa- i watched the witch once i watched the babadook once i watched it follows once i have no compunction to watch any of those movies ever I'm again the exact same way i've only seen those movies one time and i pretty much hated all of them yeah i uh the babadook was the only one that i saw one time and i hated that movie the... i think it follows was the worst movie i've ever seen really yeah uh, but that's a i mean the story it follows <laughs> is uh, a totally different movie I almost don't even see that movie as a horror movie. It's almost just like a... Well, I don't know if I see this movie as a horror movie either. Oh, I totally... Well, I, a, I lot mean, of the, no, a lot of this movie... Eric, yeah, a lot of is. this movie is just like... It, okay, 
let me put it this way, Eric. If the last 10 minutes of the movie hadn't happened the way they did, you could have just t- chalked this movie up as a character losing their mind. Yeah, and, true. And falling, yeah. Up, and falling apart psychologically, and it would not have been a horror movie. It's well, and that's they, what they build this movie up to be up until like the last fucking 20 minutes of the movie. <sighs> but we're not even talking about the major part that happens almost like 20 minutes in. 30 minutes in that totally threw everybody for a loop with and literally the daughter and made the son me sick and to the my car stomach. ride and the allergy attack like that Which, was something I have never seen in a film before. OK, so you know? uh, we haven't really gone over the plot at all in this movie. So just as a real quick run through, you have this family and it starts with the grandma who has died. The movie starts with an obituary for the grandmother saying that she is survived by her daughter and granddaughter, grandson, blah, 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 blah. Um, so you have this family who is grief stricken already, but also doesn't quite under doesn't quite know how to deal with this grief. The grandmother and the mother who is Tony Collette were estranged and... Um, the grandmother was going through dementia and had DID and wasn't all there at the end and wasn't there was a disconnect um the grandmother and the granddaughter charlie um who is seemingly on the spectrum in the movie um i don't know how you couldn't walk away from this movie thinking that her character has some sort of mental retardation yeah she's definitely yeah well but again to be fair later in the film it's also explained a way that she might not actually be mentally retarded that's true she might just be spoilers possessed by a demon but (laughs) so yeah so you have um charlie who is grandma's favorite it to the point where grandma actually breastfed Charlie, which they show in one of the miniatures, which I think I speak for everybody when I say that I thought that the miniatures were going to play a bigger role in this movie other than just like a symbolic um, sort of way for Tony Collette's character to like channel her emotions. Yeah, it was, I mean, it works. The symbolism works, but at the same time, the way that the trailers play out and everything, like I think we all thought that they were going to be a bigger deal than they were. The big thing that happens a third of the way through the movie is Charlie is essentially forced by Tony Collette um, to go to a party with Peter, her brother, played by the guy from Jumanji. Um, and we, we, at the should, party, we should emphasize the character that The Rock is possessed by in Jumanji. And let me just say, oh, Jumanji was so Jumanji much Rock. better than Hereditary. Jumanji <laughs> was so much worse. I mean, um, I'll, I'll give, I I'll give, so I'll give Rashid credit. <laughs> Jumanji was better than Hereditary, but that's because I had the lowest of lowest of low expectations for Jumanji. Hey, me there too. you go. If you had that if you had that low of expectations for hereditary then we would be singing a different tune but yeah anyways it's established early on in the movie that charlie has a nut allergy at this party she eats chocolate cake with nuts in it and so while peter is off getting stoned with his potential love interest and some other you know who cares people at this high school party she starts to have an allergic reaction she comes into the room and freaks out and says like i'm having a hard time breathing peter loads her into the back of the car and speeds the fuck off it's sort of established that these people sort of live in this like remote area. I don't really know where it is. Somebody said Utah that I was talking to. It was to, filmed but... in Utah. Yeah, I don't know. It, do- it doesn't matter where they live in the movie. They yeah. just, yeah, everybody is They're just kind clearly, of like. They clearly live somewhere that's hard for the main characters to get to. Right. You live somewhere remote where it takes you at least a solid 10 or 15 minutes to get anywhere to civilization-ish. So he's basically hauling ass down the road road in the middle of the night stoned while his younger sister is having a full-on allergic reaction in the back why nobody had an epi pen at the entire party or why he didn't bring one with him is a mystery or the mom bringing giving one to the son but this is a horror movie and we have to let stupid shit like this go this Otherwise, is a movie you wouldn't have a this horror is a movie, movie See, not a horror and, movie. and then after you know after you're done talking about the scene there are and especially this scene what happens afterwards i mean yeah it's a great scene and i really loved it but then it took me out of the movie but go ahead keep going um anyways the the big fucked up that happens is that while peter is driving down the road there is a carcass um a deer or a dog or whatever something in the road and he's hauling ass and so he swerves to not you know run over this you know animal carcass and 
Charlie has her head out the window because she's trying to breathe and she can't breathe. And they drive really, really close to this telephone pole that's on the side of the road and Charlie's face collides with this telephone pole at like, you know, 90 miles an hour. And you can't really tell at the time, uh, but she's decapitated. Um, Peter stops immediately and sort of like has this weird mental breakdown, like where he's just in shock and is just like, it's okay. You're okay. Like, and just sits there for a second looks in the rearview mirror one time and sees his sister's like limp body sort of hanging out the window and then immediately looks forward again and that's all you see and he just drives away he just drives home gets into bed and just lays there until morning when his you can hear from peter's perspective the shot is this whole sequence is the most like gut-wrenching thing that i've sat through in a long time because it's like very quiet and very methodical and it's just peter gets into his bed and he climbs in and he's just wide-eyed the entire night and you can see it from peter's perspective he can hear his mother getting up and say oh i'm gonna go to the store i'll be back in 20 minutes you hear go outside the front door closes the car door opens and closes and then you just hear her wailing and you immediately know that she found the body and then after that it cuts to charlie's head in the street covered in ants completely um just like deformed uh partially desiccated yeah partially eaten partially fucking destroyed by the telephone pole i'm assuming when she hit it going 90 also her allergy attack oh yeah so um that scene happens like 30 minutes into the movie and that's like one of those things where they built up this character so much in the trailer and then they focus on her really for the beginning of the movie totally yeah until she dies and then you're like what the fuck is even gonna happen now how is there still a movie and they do and they bring it back for sure but i think that like after this whole situation is sort of like when the movie starts to like hit this weird lull in the middle like for 20 minutes where you're just like I mean, maybe even an hour dude Nah, I don't think it was that long because there's the whole it's a long like, fucking movie. Because there's a huge grieving sequence this afterwards. This movie is like, a little long, Eric. It's two it, hours. It is too long. I heard that they cut an hour out of this movie. Yeah, there was an original three hour cut of this movie. I would watch that cut. Oh, I would fucking be so bored. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would not. And here's the thing. And, and here's the real issue with this movie, right? The real issue with this movie for me is it's a film that you know has has a twist at the end because it's clearly building to one so almost nothing that happens before the twist matters aside from one or two really innovative sequences like her character getting decapitated by the phone pole like the one of the better scenes in the movie the seance that they have the the film you know it's building to something it's going to bring all these disparate parts together at the end of the film in the last five minutes because that's the way these kinds of movies go like the witch it it brings everything together right at the end and so there were parts of this movie where i was like all right i mean i don't understand or have any fucking clue what's going on so i'm sure it's going to be explained at the end of the movie so can we just get to the end of the movie and that's not a really great way to be watching this film because the end of this movie movie as nuts as it is as crazy as it is it also feels like it's from a better or say better it feels like it's from a different movie similarly to annihilation which we watched earlier this year and we fawned all over the ending of annihilation feels like a shitty movie it feels like a shitty horror movie's ending where it's like do we know who is who is this the real natalie portman is it not i'm not even gonna say spoilers because nobody watched that movie unfortunately but this movie does that same thing where the ending feels like a different movie altogether all of a sudden it goes from this kind of reserved horror movie to this like balls to the wall shit's flying everywhere character is sawing her fucking head off with a wire oh it's, my God, it's I loved completely it insane in an I awesome way of it, yeah. but at the end of the day the whole movie isn't like that and so no. it, it's not those two disparate parts they fit together but there are a lot of edges that are sticking out it doesn't 
fit together perfectly. For me, the big problem with it is just that from each scene to scene, like, it was just so disjointed. So now you have the seance. Oh, it's the fucking, you know, the friend of the grandma, but you don't know it at the time. And she's like teaching the mom how to communicate with the dead. I'm like, okay, like, whatever. And then, you know, then before that, you know, it's a whole scene with the telephone pole. I'm like, okay, this is fucking awesome and brutal. And then like okay like all right now they're grieving whatever it's just the movie can't figure itself out and that's my biggest problem with the movie and then you know i i loved the last 15 minutes of the movie obviously it's just fucking brutal it's unrelenting it's just gonna take you over maybe a three-hour cut would make this movie way better and it would just kind of bridge each scene a little bit more smoothly and kind of connect things um well and, and here's the thing maybe if i go back and rewatch it i mean i'm not i have no intention of rewatching watching it not because it not because it upset me or it it really shocked me or anything but because it's a two hour long slow burn horror movie and i know what i'm getting myself into now maybe if i go back and rewatch it knowing that i know where the show or show knowing that knowing what the ending is going to be and where the movie is going maybe i'll appreciate it more and like pick out certain things like i don't know if you guys noticed this but on the telephone pole where her head you know, got just gonna go to this fucking yeah. part yeah yeah she there's the Before. little symbol the symbol yeah. is yeah. on the telephone the symbol pole. of payment or whatever Yeah, when they're driving to the party you see the symbol on the telephone pole and so it's like is that i mean was she decapitated then by design is yes. this on purpose that this is happening so like how deep does this you know conspiracy against this family go um by this like satanic cult you know well the grandmother offered her family up to bring payment into the world well, because for some reason it has to be by her bloodline. And they even talk about when Tony Collette's in uh, that um, like grief group. She talks about her brother um, was schizophrenic and thought that uh, the mother was trying to put voices inside of his head or was trying to put someone inside of him is what she said. Um, and he hung himself and her father starved himself to death, which is interesting because... When they show in the book, um, when they're talking about payment and they only flash on it for a little bit and they show like a few lines and they give you just a barely enough time to like read a few snippets of it. Um, it says payment, you know, this um, king of hell, one of the kings of hell or whatever, desires a male body, but needs somebody who is, uh, oh God, how to, I, I, I don't remember how they put it in the, in the movie, but essentially he needs somebody who is emotionally weakened but physically strong enough to take him and so the whole movie then makes so much more sense under the guise of breaking peter down yeah, breaking the kid down so and that, turning him into a child right so that essentially he's emotionally weak enough so that payment can inhabit him and it also makes sense that the father her father, um, Tony Collette's father, would starve himself to death because if he knew that the grandmother was trying to bring this, um, you know, king of hell into him, if he was weak enough, like physically weak enough, that she couldn't do that. And so they show all of this stuff in like a, there's an insane history of mental illness in her family, you know, like her father was totally crazy, her brother was totally crazy, her mother was totally crazy. How is she not totally crazy? type of situation but then if you look at everything through the lens of the last five fucking minutes of the movie everything means something else um and i think that's i i I don't know for me that's worth another watch just to pick up on those things just because like as i think about it and as i talk about it more there's more and more things in this movie that connect in ways that when i was watching it i had no fucking idea what was going on you don't have any idea what's going on until the last five minutes of this movie and then honestly this movie does what i think is an amazing and a terrible job at the same time of treating the audience like they're not an idiot. The whole movie spends almost two fucking hours not telling you a goddamn thing and does not treat the audience like a moron until the last 
30 seconds of the goddamn running time of the movie when it literally exposition dumps everything that happened to you and just explains everything and just hands it to you on a platter and says, now does everything make sense, you dumb fucker? Not and I was only just like, does it fuck exposition- you, I would have known! Not only does it exposition dump, it does it in the laziest exposition dump way possible, which is exposition dumping with a character speaking possibly in ADR. Yeah. Which is, which is, uh, which is, if you don't know what ADR is, is your, is the audio being replaced. After the fact. It, yeah. After the fact. And it felt like it could have possibly gone in after the fact. Like maybe they shot it and didn't have that in there. And then that was just the end of the movie. And I think if they would have had the end of the movie, instead of exposition dump, they just have at the end of the movie, Peter goes up into the fucking tree house and the decapitated oh. grandma and the mom are there and Charlie's head is on the fucking crazy idol thing and everybody's worshipping it and fucking Joni takes the crown off of Charlie's decapitated head and puts it on Peter and they just say hail Payman and then that's a fucking end of the movie do we need that to be explained to us no no Absolutely not. That Absolutely fucking not. was so lame to And that's me. the one thing that actually irks me about this movie, like more than anything else, technical errors and, um, you know, other, you know, small nitpicky things here and there. It's It does such a good job of not treating you like an idiot the entire time until the last fucking 30 seconds. And then I was literally like, oh, man, I was like, come on, you didn't need to tell me. I already fucking knew. Like, this isn't one of those movies that, like, you want to care about everybody coming out of the movie like understanding what's going on. I mean on. the whole movie they don't explain shit. You just have to pick up on it you know the way Eric picked up on like the book and kind of connecting it with the family and stuff like that. But that was like me connecting it like two days later. They And they don't hide it. They don't even like it's not even it's not even obtuse with it. It shows it on screen. Right like, yeah. Clear as day. They And you know what and they, they did something that I that irks me. They had like the page highlighted yeah. where the shit was yeah. it's like oh yeah. my God, could, why don't you just have a sticky note with an yeah, arrow pointing down a, that they says they this is bookmark. important? Yeah, <laughs> the fucking bookmark. They had a bookmark so in there, right. and you're just like, God, what? So like, stupid, Grandma? You just left it bookmarked <laughs> to the page of this last of satanic payment? ritual that you did before you died? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> It comes back to this idea of these horror movies that are being made that are really kind of like stunning the critics. This is such a stunning film. It's so out there and it's unlike any horror movie I've seen in the last decade. Yeah, well, okay, but this movie is not that creative. No, it dude, does a you nailed it. You nailed it earlier, man. It is like every year there's the one film and this film is exactly like those four other films, you know? Yeah. I I think it's the best out of all of the those other movies. I think I mean, the best out of all those movies is honestly, it's Get Out. I totally agree. I think Get Out is a totally different movie, and I think that's like comparing apples to oranges. But no, I can understand your ho- it's opinion. It's an indie horror movie. Yeah, but it's a totally different type of indie horror movie yeah. uh, because it's because it's racially driven. No, I just it, no. See, Eric loves Hereditary because we both love to hail Satan. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, that's what we want to do is we want to watch a film that's all about Satan and hell and it being kind of realistic and really fucked up and brutal. Yeah. And I and I get that. That's totally Eric's style of film. Honestly, my like three favorite type of horror movies are like satanic cult movies, uh, alien horror movies and like possession Jumanji. And Jumanji, yeah. Um, no, and like possession horror movies. You really like The Kill List. Kill List is amazing. I love Kill List. But is it a horror movie? No. Kind of? It's a horror movie only in feeling, not It's better in than this movie, that's for sure. Well, also, Kill List does not explain shit at Which all. Which is great. Which is great. And I think... That's uh, what this movie should have done. I think more movies need to take a cue from movies like Kill List and stuff. But movies like Kill List are like, nobody fucking saw Kill List, like... 18 people have ever seen the movie Kill List, I think and it's be only surprised. because it was on I Netflix. You, I think you'd be surprised how many people have seen Kill List. No, I mean, but Kill List has been out for, like, what, almost 10 years at this point? So, like, yeah, a lot of people have seen it. And it's great, and people should see it, because Kill List is the shit. But at the same time, Kill List did not 
get the critical acclaim that this movie did. And I and here's the thing. And I think that's because this movie is more accessible. And whether or not that accessibility was roped in after the fact, especially because that's a problem. There's a problem when you shoot a three-hour movie and you cut a fucking hour out of it. Like, that's you. And I know this is his first time. And I'm going to give him some serious props, Ari Aster, for shooting a fucking fantastic first movie. Like, holy shit. If this is your first movie. Like, honestly, I hope you didn't blow your whole fucking load on this one because the next movie you make, like, the expectations are going to be very high. Um, I hate almost, to break it to you. It's probably not going to remotely live up to this. Oh, yeah. It's going to be extremely detrimental. And I feel already sort of bad that this movie got hyped so much and has gotten so much acclaim so far. He's not going to be looking for work anytime soon he's 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 set for whatever the fuck he wants to do next but also at the same time he's f- whatever he does next he's fucked because unless it's like the fucking scariest most amazing thing that we've ever seen it's never ever gonna live up to the hype that this movie got well and that's the thing right so when we look at these writer directors who wrote these horror movies and then directed them the the, the the people i look at are you've got obviously jordan peele get out you have the gentleman who directed it follow whose name escapes me. You have the guy who directed The Witch, which is not the same guy who directed It Follows, right? No, The Witch guy is, I that think, was also- that was his first film, I think. Uh, yeah. His yeah, first the like, feature. Was, right? Yeah, And then you have someone like John Watts, who, if you know who John Watts is, he wrote and directed Clown, which, yeah. for all of its problems, Clown's a pretty fun movie. I like Clown. Yeah, I think Clown's, Clown's cool. Great. And then he, he writes and directs Cop Car, which which is a pretty cool movie. I enjoyed it a lot. It's a very different movie from Clown. And then what's his third movie? What's his fucking third movie? Spider-Man Homecoming. Oh, that's right. I totally right? forgot about that. So I wouldn't be surprised if Ari Aster is directing a Marvel movie in four years. Iron Man eight. Yeah, I don't know. He's doing a fucking, you know, um, who knows? Yeah, he's doing uh, Bucky the Second Avenger. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe he'll pull a Duplass Brothers and be like, "I'm too good to work for Marvel. That's oh, not yeah. my thing." I mean, Duplass Brothers. Okay, all right, guys. You know your audience, and you know the kind of movies you want to do. Like, we great. get it. You're hipsters. You don't admit That's to fine. your friends that you don't like. We get that you don't admit to your friends that you like Marvel movies. We got it. You have beards. We get it. You put but oil honestly, in them. That's fine. But honestly, I respect the decision to like really work in your wheelhouse because making those big huge like you know 150 200 million dollar movies is a totally totally different ball game than making your you know five ten million dollar indie film that you're used to making where you yeah maybe you have to like beg borrow and steal and make shit up and sort of like work with what you got type of situation but at the same time you also have maybe more creative control than you would on a gigantic Marvel movie and more freedom as we saw with Solo, a Star Wars story, when you hire the guys from the fucking Lego movie and you say, yeah, make a fucking Han Solo movie and then they get 80% of the way through it and then you go, oh fuck, what did we do? We gave them too much freedom (laughs) and then they fucking cut them out and then they bring in Ron fucking Moneybags Howard and Ron Howard finishes the movie. Now, I'm not saying that Solo's a shit movie because I actually kind of liked Solo, and I thought it was a totally serviceable and fine Star Wars movie. Um, but but it's you don't get also, to make this movie for Disney. Right. You don't get to make this movie for Disney. You don't get to make this movie for Marvel. Like, I don't see Marvel outside of the Deadpool movies, but even the Deadpool movies at this point are wrote and sort of just generic. And it's all corporate. It's, yeah. It's, it wrote, it's yeah. wrote after one movie, which is so sad. And so I don't, I don't see a rated R Star Wars movie. I don't see a rated R, like truly rated R Marvel movie coming anytime soon. Like oh, we're not going to see the happen. Punisher yeah. like the way that we all want to see the Punisher. You're not going to see Boba Fett we're solo not, yeah. movie at, in the style of John Wick. Yeah, so. we're not going to see a John Wick Boba Fett movie, which would be or even a Boba Fett solo film, (laughs) or even a Boba Fett solo film in the vein of Logan, which is why I don't understand why everyone was getting so excited for it. Yeah, exactly. 
I don't care about this Boba Fett movie because if it's not a rated R like revenge style like fucking weird bounty western hunter bounty hunter like movie then who cares because that's what makes that character cool is because he can do all of that stuff and make it awesome uh, dude they're gonna fuck it up there's no question yeah but you know whatever we're gonna get a Star Wars movie every year until we die eventually it's gonna be two a year yeah uh, eventually it'll be every other month Star Wars needs to figure out that the Marvel the Marvel template template does not work for them or it doesn't even work for star wars which is owned by the company that made the connected universe model work so well <sighs> whatever unless uh, kevin feige leaves marvel the marvel mcu and then hops on the star wars <laughs> cinematic universe he moves from mcu to swcu i i mean whatever but yeah we're getting off topic uh, we talk about marvel movies yeah. and well, let's- this <laughs> shit every single time we do a podcast uh yeah, you can't. Let's take a break real quick, and when we get back, we'll finish up talking about the movie we're supposed to be talking about. Who is Carl Kolchak? He's a reporter. Now that is news, Vincenzo. News! And we are a news paper. We are supposed to print news, not suppress it. With the INS. What's an INS? Independent news servicer founded in 1904 by Enrico Peluzzi. Who seems to have a nose for the strange and unusual. Well, last year in Las Vegas, I uncovered a series of murders that turned out to have been committed by a vampire. And what is the Kolchak Tapes? It's a podcast all about Carl Kolchak. What's a Kolchak? The Night Stalker. And where can you get it? On iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and at www.kolchaktapes.com. As foolish a game as any that Gory the Ghoul could make up. Socks don't have to come in just black and white, and at Jilly's Socks and Such, you can find not only that unique pair of sassy socks, but also gifts for any occasion. Started by former teacher Lori and former student, now namesake Jillian, their store has a pair of socks for every event, personality, and interest. Be it a snarky pair for work, a pair emblazoned with your favorite sports team, or just something silly for lounging, Jilly's Socks and Such can have you sliding into your new favorite pair of socks today. I just recently picked up a pair of Bigfoot socks that are about as badass as they are comfy, and they are a perfect addition to my growing collection of socks. They are located at 3900 Old Cheney Road, Suite 202, Lincoln, Nebraska, and online at jillysocks.com. Mention the Culture Cast and get 15% off your next purchase at Jillies. And remember, let your socks do the talking at Jillies Socks and such. Here's what some people are saying about the Projection Booth podcast. Week after week, I'm mesmerized by the focus given great films and questionable films alike. But every episode is a learning and entertaining experience. This is hands down the best movie podcast. They cover so many different genres across so many years, from obscure movies to blockbusters. If there's only one podcast about movies and cinema that you listen to, make it this one. The Projection Booth Podcast, with new episodes available every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. All right, we are back. We had a very late break, but we're going to finish up talking about Hereditary. So outside of the fact that this movie was overhyped, which it was, I think all three of us can agree on that. On... Unfortunately, I mean, and that's like, it's hard to avoid. And I almost feel like maybe I overhyped it for you because I was so crazily affected by this movie and I had to tell somebody and talk to somebody about it like immediately. And uh, you're the obvious choice when it comes to like me seeing movies that have somebody that I need to talk to it about. So I feel partially responsible that I was part of your overhyping experience. And I mean, you, you, you overhyped it didn't really factor into it. It was, again, that perceived note. I mean, it did kind of, and I mean, because I trust your opinion more than I trust a nameless, faceless movie critic I've never met that I can't actually, like, get to know and kind of know where they're coming from with their opinion. This movie, The Witch, it follows the Babadook to some extent. It comes at night, which is kind of the one that everybody always forgets Oh, I love It Comes at Night. But it got overhyped, too. It Comes at Night was insanely overhyped, and I somehow missed it being hyped at all and was just, like, stoked to watch it and was very happy with that movie. And anybody who heard anything good about that movie fucking hates it. But this movie really is just Rosemary's Baby for the 21st century. Like, I... Almost and I'm okay with fault. that. If they remake and the Rosemary's Baby story once every 50 years, I think that's 
fine. As long as they don't do it every five years, I'm cool with it. The problem is, is unless you really don't like Roman Polanski, which I mean, it, I completely understand if you don't. You are completely justified in not liking Roman Polanski for multiple reasons, namely one of them being he raped a fucking teenager. Okay, uh, rapes aside, Rosemary's uh, Baby is a fucking and all of Hollywood has descended has decided to defend him. Well, yeah, but that's the Hollywood's terrible, right? Him raping a teenager aside. Statutory or not. Rosemary's Baby is 10 times better. I mean, but also Rosemary's Baby was the first one. So that's like saying Raiders of the Lost Ark is the best Indiana Jones movie when like maybe The Last Crusade is the best Indiana Jones. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is the best one. Don't you say that Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is the best one. I will fucking kill you. When everybody knows that Temple of Doom is the best yeah, one. Yeah, dude. Kali Ma. <laughs> uh, Prepare to mock, meet Kali in hell. You know, all that good stuff. Yeah, but Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones. That's my issue. <laughs> well, I mean, it's got the most racist characters of all the Indiana Jones yeah, films. Arguably. That's for sure. Nobody cares if you're being racist the problem- to Germans. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> The thing I walked away from Hereditary with was just an overwhelming sense of been there, done that before. Yeah, that's it's yeah. it's interesting. Other than like two like key parts, you know, the telephone scene or with the pole, and then the wire, and she's like cutting off her fucking head. Like I totally agree. Yeah, and, and, and again, two cool kind of out there moments don't exactly. make a great film. Yeah. They don't even make a watchable. Yeah, film. I, I I think um, I'm gonna agree and disagree with you at the same time about the originality of this movie that like yes maybe the concepts in general of this movie are not original but i also think that the way that they tell this story is very original conceptually wise sure it's been done before but i think it hasn't not it it definitely hasn't been done like this i don't know man it's shot the same way as all the other indie horror films i feel like it's got that it's like this weird like indie horror like filter it's like the wes anderson of horror movies (laughs) it's just like this filter in all the thing it's like you know like they suck all the they suck all the color i think it's a24 when they buy a movie they it there's just a filter that just goes on it that's the a24 filter and that's what happens in post well i was gonna say don't get me started because a24 is i want another company to goddamn put out fucking cool movies because any the next time i see a movie that's like an a24 movie i'm just like fuck another fucking a24 horror movie that's like exactly what you're gonna expect you know exactly what you're gonna get so i want somebody else like you know what you're gonna get from blumhouse you know what you're gonna get from a24 like somebody else put out an effective solid horror movie i it doesn't even need to be the scariest thing since the exorcist it just needs to be good do you know what this reminds me of eric this reminds me of the black coats Ah, dude i hate that fucking movie i I love that movie this reminds me of the black coats daughter and you know what the black coats daughter is a better no actually could be right and i literally hate the fucking black coast that's daughter. not true i uh the black coast daughter is not better than this movie but it is very similar yeah it is it's not no it is not dude b- between tone not explaining shit like it really is like the black coat's daughter and then there's okay in the black coast daughter there's the one scene that's creepy it's the fucking girl praying to the shadow satan in the boiler room and yeah and, dude it's literally they're all and there's all and there's, the and there's a big twist movies. at the end where she's a yeah. demon where she's like possessed but okay and you know what i'll go one step even further eric you know why the black coat's daughter is a better movie than this movie because the black coat's daughter wasn't hyped into the fucking ground except for by eric it came completely up well eric was the one who asked me to black watch coat's black coat's daughter here. that's why we did like dude podcast this is the best over. fucking movie black coat's daughter also was like one of those movies that was finished and shown and then didn't come out for like three years right You're and like, so i was I waiting for black coat for daughter. like three years to watch that movie and then when it finally came out i was like oh thank god i fucking watched it finally um let's not forget the f- i believe the first horror movie that a24 put out do oh, it was Tusk, it is, and that's the fucking best movie. Uh, it I was. fucking will defend Tusk <laughs> until the, the day I die. Tusk has is fantastic, done. and if you don't like Tusk, then you have a shitty sense of humor, and you should fucking suck a dick. I don't like Tusk. <laughs> if you don't like Tusk, it's probably, it's probably because you're it's probably because you're yeah, mentally sane. If you don't like Tusk, you're probably a normal human being with normal human interactions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tusk is a really bad movie, but in a really yeah. fun way. Oh yeah. It's 
It's a it's a movie that's great to watch. It's a it's a movie that's great to watch with someone else who doesn't know what it is and watch their yeah. reactions. No, I I mean I went to go see that movie with Cody and um, Cody's now fiance and uh, some girl that I was taking out at the time, and me and Cody were dying laughing the entire movie and the two girls that we took literally had no idea what was going on and thought we were mentally retarded well and to be fair the movie is so stupid that's fair, not surprising also we but might be retarded it, it <laughs> it's stupid yeah. in a good way though it's not stupid in like a it's just it's dumb it's just but a dumb like, fucking you know, movie and that's yeah that's kevin if, smith you know you gotta like i don't know you gotta like that kind of you gotta be ready for that kind of shit um i don't know anyways a20 Make more movies like Tusk A24. That's what I'm saying. Is and, and stop making movies that have all of this, the color drained out of them and they're gray and brown. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of weird, right? Like that whole it, color it, palette is... Every fucking movie now. Yeah. Every horror movie. This movie had some interesting uses of color, like the red um, like heater lamps in the in the um, tree house and stuff I thought was uh, super creepy and really effective. Um, yeah, there was a lot of blues um, and sort of like muted colors because a lot of the gnarly shit happens at night. It's and so the dark. You yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of like moonlight shit. Yeah, Yeah. there's a lot of moonlight shit that's happening. Like the lights aren't off, but there's lots of windows. Like I get it. I get what they were trying to do for that and like have the naked cult people. Like you can see him. Oh, no, you can't see him. Oh, wait, no, they actually are there. But it just doesn't work and it just feels so unoriginal. It's like, okay, I get it. I've seen it. Yeah, but then what? I mean, you're going to watch a movie like the Neon Demon that was like insane, like 70s level of like super color and insane and beautiful and that's a beautiful movie i don't know if either of you guys have ever seen neon demon but neon demon is absolutely gorgeous the way that it's shot in these like bright crazy vibrant literally neon colors the entire time and it's sort of this hyper realistic you know sort of like um hollywood you know uh la new york vegas ish you know nightclub uh model like atmosphere that's like really put up to like 11 and it's a wonderful movie to look at but i think substance wise like it really also falls short so i mean i don't know i'll take a movie that's like a little bit normal to look at that actually is effective than a movie that's like really pretty that doesn't fucking do anything for me any day of the week no i i mean i can appreciate that for sure it's just these a24 horror films kind of all have a very similar sure. look to yeah, them, yeah. it's a, like i said it's the wes anderson effect it's the wes anderson horror movies i'm not joking some of the fi- like some of the shots like especially with the miniatures and everything i was like this is a fucking full-on wes anderson shot right now bill murray's just a miniature in the bill house. murray <laughs> If Bill Murray cameoed in this movie, I would fucking lose my mind. So, Rashid, what would you give the film out, out of five? five or three? That's a hard three. What about you, Eric? Um, out of five... I'm going to give this movie like a four and a half out of five. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that's high. But I mean, I gave it a nine out of ten. And honestly, I, you know, I think this movie definitely has shortcomings, you know, whether it's the originality of the idea or the muted color palette or the slow 20 minutes in the middle or the um, unnecessary exposition dump at the very, very end. I think a lot of that stuff can be forgiven because of the tone and the way that this movie overall affected me. See, if the movie didn't infe- like it did affect me the same way it did you, and if it didn't give that for me, I would literally give this like a one out of five. But because it did, and you know, there were parts that I liked, and there were parts that I really loved, you know, just some of the few scenes and the brutality of everything. Well, and that's the, why I yeah. give it the three. And those brutal sequences are really few and far between in the movie. Like, the movie is really almost like a character study on this family really falling yeah. apart the entire time and if you're not invested in that um yeah then you're not right then you're not gonna care and you're not you're gonna not, like the movie you're yeah. not gonna like the movie i'm i think and you know what i just realized we actually had another horror movie this year that was super hyped up movie so you don't even remember a quiet place oh i mean a quiet place was good yeah 
It was fine. Yeah, it was okay. As another first time director, but that movie is totally different than this movie. That's like a monster movie. That's like a yeah. But similarly, it falls apart. Similarly, it starts to fall apart the closer it gets towards the end of the movie. Yeah, and then it totally does have like a Ash Williams sort of like shotgun like situation at the very end. But you know, whatever that happens. Uh, this is my yeah. Boomstick. She would have said uh, groovy. I I would have been all about groovy. It. Um, <laughs> oh my god, they made it evil dead sequel we just didn't know about. uh ash is a girl again yeah i would give this film a two and a half out of five i think it's very derivative in the spots that it shouldn't have been it's an interesting concept but the ending being super crazy and the cool part with that one of the characters being decapitated yeah that's fun and that's fine and that's different but there's so much in between that's just so not interesting and just kind of feels rote and it's building to something and then when we finally get the payoff the payoff is good but then the payoff ruins itself it's almost too much of a good thing it just ruins itself right at the end it has a chance to not go full like mainstream horror movie where we have to explain everything to you I think Rashid has the best idea for the ending tell him what you told me the ending should have been oh so absolutely no narration you know you just they take the crown off of the daughter they put it onto the son and they start all chanting hail payment and then credits and credits are usually Usually what six minutes five minutes maybe seven minutes and literally no score it's just chanting hail payment hail payment for the entire roll of the credits and could you imagine but maybe let out? it linger on his well, face yeah right just right a it's bit. just his face and maybe the credits going over it and then imagine walking out of the movie and you're just hearing hail payment and then you get out of the movie and you're out of the door and it because it's really fucking loud you're still kind of hearing it out of the door in the hallway of the theater hail payment and then now you're outside of the theater and now it's just in your head hail payment would have been fucking amazing no but instead it's instead it's let's explain the entire movie to you here's the keys to everything that we just already explained to you right now um yeah i don't know like i said you know that movie goes 99 percent of the way treating you like a normal human being and then treats you like an idiot for one percent of the time and it just uh almost ruins the entire thing but it's the one percent that sticks with you because Because it's it's very right at the end, end yeah, of the movie. Which sucks. What do you think the film has on Rotten Tomatoes? Yeah, I think it's probably like a 94. 92%. Hereditary uses its classic setup as the framework for a harrowing, uncommonly unsettling horror film whose cold touch lingers long beyond the closing credits. However, the audience score is a 59%. Yeah, that totally makes sense, yeah. This is going to be a very divisive m- It's a critics movie. fucking movie, it's dude. A critics critics movie. love this fucking Everybody's already like... Like, Tony Collette for fucking Best Actress. And I'm just like, yeah, all right, that would be great. No Absolutely way. Absolutely no. not, dude. No oh, way. I thought she was fantastic. Dude, the son could be fucking Best Actress. No, she's great, but. Over that. No, no I'm thought- just kidding. The son was the worst actor and took me out of it almost the whole time. The son took me out of it a couple of times. Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> his crying was the worst yes but I, isn't that the point i know like that's Eric the point said? of the movie to break him down to yeah. take him from a like bitchy teenager yeah, who's like actor. who's like hard and like you know unrelenting and hates his mom and you know whatever is like this stoic teen and then you break him down to a fucking whimpering child i understand that that is the whole point but at the same time there's something about his fucking cry that just irks me really bad literally the the whole just, theater was just <laughs> laughing. And I was like, oh, okay, like you can say mommy. I totally that I get at that yeah. at that at that point when she's like upside down on the ceiling banging her face up against the fucking like uh door to the but it's the mixture of the crying and then the mommy thing but he um, cries so early on, like he cries so many times during the movie like all of a sudden out of nowhere like yeah. when they're doing the seance all of a sudden he starts oh, yeah. to whimper <laughs> yeah. like a little bitch and I'm like no that would never happen I'm like this doesn't happen in real life like come the rock on doesn't cry like that uh, the rock does not cry <laughs> so one thing that we've been doing recently is reading two 
reviews from two separate publications. Uh, the more, the more quote unquote veritable ones. So the one, one of the ones that we always read is Mr. Peter Travers over at the Rolling Stones, who says, where the fuck was it? Ah, he gave it a fresh review in its sense of poisoned family bloodlines of the everyday invaded by unspeakable evil of bone chilling terror. You won't be able to shake. Hereditary is a new horror landmark. Tony Collette should have Oscar calling. Okay, three and a half out of four stars. The other review worth noting is Matt Zoller cites on RogerEbert.com. He took over for writing for Roger Ebert. His review is the 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 shortened review on Rotten Tomatoes is three words. Creepy beyond belief. He gave the film a perfect four out of four. I don't know if it's perfect. Yeah, it's a but, critics uh, movie. It it's seems a, to be getting totally. Is. Yeah, it seems to be getting the critics it's a attention. Critics movie. For sure. The critics are like all about this movie. You know what other movie the critics are all yeah. about this week, though? Ocean's 8. And that movie looks fucking god awful. I mean, I've got a movie pass, so <laughs> no I mean, desire. why not? No desire. Well, uh, let's take one more break and we'll play a preview for the next Culture Cast. Yeah? I'm Peter Beatstruck. The devil's son in law. Rudy Ray Moore is Petey Weedstraw, starring Leroy and Skillet, Jimmy Funky Crab Lynch, and Wild Man Steve. Rated R. That's right. On the next culture cast, we're going to be talking about Petey Wheatstraw, the Devil's son-in-law. Yeah, the title rhymes. It's a black exploitation film. I've never seen it, but apparently Quentin Tarantino rips off a whole lot of shit from it. Which not surprising. To be honest, Quentin. <laughs> not Tar- surprising. Yeah, yeah, not surprising. Quentin Tarantino couldn't go five minutes without <laughs> ripping off somebody, r- ripping off something from someone more than likely a minority <laughs> or someone who. I, I mean, a minority, uh, be it Italian, yeah, yeah. be it Anybody. black exploitation. Quotation, be it samurai films. I mean, he just yeah. Fuck Quentin Tarantino. Fucking Quentin Tarantino, dude. He's always, you know, he's uh, yeah, he's trying to get you. Yeah, I don't know. But un- until then, Eric, what have you been up to? Not a goddamn thing. Just watching these movies. Been uh, keeping my. Oh, I watched that new Halloween. 
trailer trying to temper my expectations for that but it looks cool so um yeah we only have like several more months until that comes out uh yeah it looks cool the idea is all right and like i'm okay with them uh you know skipping over all the shitty in between halloween movies that yeah, nobody gave a shit about halloween 3 was halloween cool though let's three be honest also had nothing to do with michael myers so like it's Both you the... but yeah. it's still a good movie season of the witch what no no that's the one where there's like the masks and they're like mind control things and it turns the kid its heads into yeah. worms yeah that movie's cool for all the different it's reasons. definitely a weird fucking movie um other than that nothing you know just keeping my ear to the ground for stuff that's coming out at e3 uh god some of these fucking video games look like fucking better movies than a lot of the movies that we're fucking getting so um ain't that the so truth yeah i don't know just uh just that man just uh you know getting to it going through it and as always you can follow me on twitter at culture stash you can follow eric on twitter at tyco magnetics rashid do you have a twitter (laughs) smart man wise man once said no need to be on social media if you don't have to uh you can follow the website on twitter at culture shocked and in the show notes you'll find links over to itunes where you can rate and review the show you'll find a link to patreon where you can kick a couple dollars our way and the culture cast is on the spreaker app if you want to help us out download the app listen there but we're on all podcatchers both iTunes and Android, so we've got everything covered. Big thanks to you, hey, Rashid, for, for joining us me. to sit and talk. This has been a pretty long podcast, but I think the movie deserved it. It's been pretty Oh, God, pretty and we hyped. didn't even touch on a lot of the shit that happened in this movie. We could talk for a whole nother fucking hour about this movie without even trying. Yeah, pretty much. As always, big thanks to Eric, Rashid, and Mavoka for the intro music, and to my good buddy Justin Scott for the outro music, and we'll catch you on the next Culture Cast. You know how we do, I'm just two step, strike with my right hand, going in my other hand, getting to the money, oh man, two step, hustle with the crew, with the crew, yeah, you know how we do, hey, two step, you know what I'm saying, one, two, one, two, been jamming.